Tonight, I, I want to talk about, you know, because we are now in the days of Sfira, we are counting, and uh, I want to talk about what that really means within the context of Gula redemption. Okay? Uh, and that's what I want to speak about, uh, the meaning of it, uh, especially how it fits with the Gula itself, you see. And uh, we will see very, some very interesting ideas that come out of this, <clears throat> you see. Now, I had mentioned um, quite a while ago, there's a, pa- a pasuk in Itzovim, uh, which I had mentioned a while, but I want to now say that pasuk again and begin to explain how this fits really into the entire Tikkun process, uh, which we will see, which is really very fascinating, you know. Uh, where it says that, um, well, in its sub it says, V'shov Hashem Elokecho, and God will re- bring back, return, you know, God, your God will return, as Shvoscho, your, cap- your people, your captivity, V'richamecho, and He will have mercy on you. And then it says, V'shov, and he will return, the Kibetcha and gather you, Mikolu Amim, from all the nations, Ashehefitzko, Ashemelokecho Shamo, which God has scattered you, dispersed you there. So that Pasik basically says that God will return with you, and that's an implication that he goes together with us in Galut, you see, and he will return the captivity. And then he will have mercy on you. That's a very important concept that he will have mercy upon you, which means really the Jews without the mercy cannot be redeemed. That's what it means because if we are pidin in terms of deserving it, if we really deserve the redemption, so what need do we have really of mercy? You see, but the idea is that we don't really deserve redemption, which I had mentioned in one of the actually videos and so on, you know. And there are obviously the reason for that, which I had mentioned, is because the redemption will take place because we are in an environment and we ourselves are in the Memtet Shari Tuma, the 49 levels of defilement. You see, that's how bad the environment is. So therefore, we don't really deserve to be redeemed. But God will redeem us, right? And I mentioned also, very important, that that is the reason why there's so much incredible suffering today. And the idea to that is because we don't really deserve it. So therefore, there's tremendous, what's called kitrugim, the tremendous prosecutions by the Satan. Of course, who says that we don't deserve it, so why are you doing it? He questions the Rebbe And of course, the Rebbe has to abide by justice, dinim, And therefore, he is going to increase enormously the darkness to to, uh, allow the Jews, therefore, to deserve it according to the dinam. And that's Rachamim, because we don't really deserve it. You see, he doesn't have to do that. But this is all part of what's called the rehabilitation. And that's what the Barsham does. So therefore, obviously, without mercy, without the concept of rehabilitation, the gula, the redemption would never happen. You see. And then it says that he will return with us and gather you with Kibetzcha from all the peoples. You see. But we don't really know where that kibbutz will happen. Kibbutz means to gather. But when will that happen? You see, we don't really see it from this Pasuk. But it does say that he will gather you from all the nations where the Rebbe has dispersed you or scattered you, spread you out. Now, the next per- Pasuk is much more specific because it says, and even if you are outcasts, those people who are dispersed, are at the ends of heaven, from there, that God, your God, will gather you in, and from there, he will take you. 
That's a very important pasuk because it tells us that the Mosheim is not just going to gather us and then, then unite us with him. No. He's going to come into the pit, so to speak, into the klipa, into the tumor itself. And he will gather us within that klipa, which is an incredible act of chesed, because why would the Mosheim come into that klipa, into the defilement, the environment of defilement itself, and gather us? But that's what he's going to do. So it says that, and then it says, Umisham, and from there, again, into that pit of defilement, of Tumah, he will take you. So from here, from this passage, we learn that the Barsham is going to come actually into what's called the Klippa, into the Tumah, into the Sitra Akhra, into the, the, the haven of the Satan. And he's actually going to come in there and actually take us. And there are two things mentioned. Kibbutz, he will gather us. And then it says, Yikuchecho, he will take us. And those two terms are very important because they indicate the two phases of the redemption. And that's why there are two terms. <clears throat> and then it says, Vehebiacho, Hashem Lokecho, again, the Lord your God will bring you El Ha'oretz to the land, right? Ashiyoshu Avosecho, that your forefathers possessed, right? Which obviously is Eretz Yisrael. Virishto, and you will possess it permanently. And then it says, really incredible, Behitifcho, and he will do good for you. He will be very good to you. Behirbecho, and he will make you more numerous than your forefathers. Which means there's no more persecutions that will diminish the number of the Jewish people. And then it says that he will circumcise, the Bonash will circ- circumcise your heart and the heart of your children in order that you may love God, your God, right, with all your heart and with your soul, in order that you may live forever. Right? These psukim are clearly messianic. You see, they are clearly messianic, and which is very important. And they actually describe the stages of the Geula, which I want to talk about, and related to Egypt, because you saw these very stages in Mitzrayim, and related to today, what stages we are up to, and what is about to happen. Okay? And uh, so really the, the Torah now reveals the stages, the chronology, of the redemption itself, how it happens, you see. So, the first thing it says in the beginning by Ravi, and it will be that when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, you see, and then it starts that the Russian will come back with us. So, the first thing we see is that there's going to be a tremendous amount of, you know, there's blessings, which have happened to the Jewish people, and there's a tremendous amount of suffering. And these are the curses. And then, after that is over, we then begin to experience the redemption itself. So basically, what I want to focus on is these two terms. One is kibbutz, and the other is kicho. Kibbutz means to gather, and kicho, of course, means to take. Because that is extremely relevant to today. You see, so if we really begin to think about it, what do we see? Kibbutz means to gather. And remember, this gathering is in the klipa itself, which means it will take place in America, Europe, wherever the Jews are, and of course in Eretz Israel. That's where the Geula will begin. Uh, you see, it's only afterwards the Torah says, and God will bring us back to Eretz Israel. You see, that's not how it starts. When the Bosham will enter the, the, the Golis itself, the exile itself, and take us out. Why? Because only a God, only the Rebbe Shalom, can take us out of this exile. And that indicates how bad it is. That means the Jews will have sunk 
so low that it is not a natural phenomenon for the Jews to come back. It's over with. That's what it means. And only the Rabbanu need a divine being, the Rabbanu Shalom, to take us back. That is why the Rabbanu Shalom has to bring us back to Eretz Yisrael by he himself entering the Tumor. Think about that, what that means. Because that means, like I said, it's an indication of how low the Jews will be. Where most Jews will be gone. And therefore it takes the power of God, the power of a divine being, who is a Kul Yocho, to be able to bring us back. You see, because without divine intervention, you cannot have a Geula. Not only because there are so many things that have to happen in terms of opposing the Goyim, but the Jews themselves will have sunk so low, as I said, that you need him to bring us back. So the good news is that it's not like we have to somehow figure it out and then come out and all leave the world and there we will, we will meet the Rebbe Shalom. No. It's going to happen in the Klippa, which means America, Europe, Eretz Yisrael in terms of the ear of Rav, and also wherever Jews are found, which, by the way, happens to be all over the world, which itself is astounding. Because when you think about that, that's highly unusual. You do not find any nation that is so dispersed as the Jewish people. Anywhere you go, almost, the islands in the Pacific, South America, any of the foreign countries, you see, I'm not even talking about Europe or America or Canada, but you go to Mexico, you know, you go to Central America, like I say, you know, South America, and you go to uh, Asia, wherever you go, you'll always find a Jew. It's astounding that the Bajam has spread Klai Yisrael throughout the world. And there's a reason for that. It's not only because that's what we deserve, because part of our job is to take out the Kedusha of every nation that has taken the Kedusha. You see, it's called the Sparks of Holiness. The Sparks of Holiness, you see, which are part of the power of the spheres, has been removed and taken throughout all the nations because of the sins of the Jews. So we actually have to go there and remain righteous or whatever or suffer. And we have to take out the sparks that exist in all the nations of the world. Now, in order for that to happen, we have to go everywhere. That's why, you see? And that is why the dispersion or the galut, the exile of the Jews, is unheard of. That a nation of 14 million people should be distributed throughout the entire planet. That is absolutely historical. It's incredible. But this is why. So therefore, what you see from these psukum, you know, it's amazing when you take a look at the psukum, and if you look at it through the framework or through the eyes of Hashkofa, you begin to see the stages of redemption. Uh, therefore, the Bonsham is kibbutz. He will gather us. Now, what kibbutz basically means is this. The Bonsham has to separate us from the nations. You see, we are now assimilated in America, for instance. We are assimilated, in fact, Unfortunately, we look at ourselves as only Americans. You know, it's one thing if you want to look at yourself as American Jews at least, so at least you recognize the Jewish part. But how many Jews are there that recognize themselves as only Americans? You know, and that's really what they see themselves, you see? And that's how assimilated we really are, you see, totally. And therefore what the Bonshon has to do is separate us he has to allow us to have a distinct identity called the Jew, which we'll see happen to also Mitzrayim. And therefore, kibbutz means to separate from, to separate us in terms of how we identify ourselves as Goyim, or as non-Jews, or as, uh, you know, American citizens, not as Jews. And the second thing he has to do, besides separating us, is then in some way gather us. Gather us is the, is, is the more uh, serious attempt to begin the process of removal, to remove us from the creeper, from the gullus. 
which means to remove us from America, Europe, anywhere, South America, Central America, Asia, whatever. So you have the concept here of kibbutz, means that God wants to separate us from the Goyim, the non-Jews, and eventually gather us, you see, where we now see ourselves as Jews, okay, and begin to be removed from the, from the Goyim. So that's the concept of kibbutz. Kicho, where it says then God will, he will take you, it means that we now enter a period of holiness. You see, we change. Something will happen based on this Pasuk that we will change, you know. And we're going to change, you know, in America to a great extent. That's why we will leave. That's why we will go to Eretz Yisrael. And going to Eretz Yisrael, the taking, so to speak, is we will now absorb tremendous amount of holiness, you see. And the one who brings this holiness, Kiddusha, of course, is God. And that's what it says, that God will bring you to Eretz Yisrael, to the land of your fathers. And you will possess it, means that there will be nobody else. All the Arabs will be gone, or completely uh, in a situation where they realize that the Jews are supreme, and in that land, we are now beginning to witness the messianic process where it says he will do good to you, the Hatova, right? And he will make you more numerous than your forefathers and circumcise your heart and so on to love God. This is messianic, you see. And not only that, but then it says that the Russian will bring all of these curses on your enemies, all those people that try to destroy you. So it's not just a redemption for us. It's a payback to the Goyim that destroyed us, slaughtered us, and so on, which is a very important concept. And in that land, what will happen? We will observe the commandments, which is interesting. That's what the Vanisham wants. And then it says, which is really beautiful, that the Vanisham, it says, and when this happens, right, then you will return to Hashem, and He will then rejoice over you, the Toiv, the way he rejoiced over your forefathers, because you will be listening to the Bansham, Dishmo Mitzvah to observe all his commandments and his decrees, which is written in the Torah. It's incredible when you think about that, that this is the end. This is the way it all ends. A complete return to the Rabban Shalom and his commandments. And that is the Messianic. So, kibbutz then is separation and gathering. And kicho, right, is where you come back. We, we, we begin to receive, you get closer to the Baruch Shalom, right? And you begin to experience His holiness, coming back to Eretz Yisrael. And, of course, that is the beginning of a messianic process. This, then, is a very important concept. Uh, the concept of kibbutz to separate and to gather, and the concept of kicho, that God will take you, which means we actually get close to God. And that's truly messianic. I mean, they're all, it's all messianic, but this is the end result of it, you see. Now, from this we can begin to understand very important ideas. Now, I, I once mentioned this idea, but it, it's important to remember that there are different stages of reality. And that's very important to understand the, the stages of the process of Tikkun and that you actually see this in Egypt. And this really, in many ways, encapsulates, it's a summary of the essence of the journey of the Jew. You see. Now, I had mentioned a while ago, you know, a very important idea that there are different realities. One reality, of course, is the revenge, is the reality of God. <clears throat> and he created a neshama, which is called a zulosoi, an other. And that is the greatest thing he ever created, is a neshama. Not the malachim, but the neshama that he created. Of course, it's God, and part of that divinity is the sfirot, the divine emanations, which is the instrument God uses. But the product of that instrument, the greatest one of all, is the neshama, 
And that is something which is considered to be other, Zulosoi. And that is the second reality. Third reality, of course, is the world of spirituality, which is the interface between him, God, and the, and the Nishama. Uh, the Malachim are the interface, means they're the intermediaries between, like I said, him and, and the Nishamas, right? And what he did is he encapsulated all of them, he enclosed them all, right, in Geshem, in physicality, which I had mentioned. And physicality is very important because it allows us to be tested. It allows us to have a task. And that task, in some way, is to see past the environment created by the physical world and to see that there is a divine world. There is a spiritual world. That's the essence. And that is why we have a physical garb, costume, so to speak. And then eventually, by our recognition that we are physical, we actually transform the physical into ruchmi, spiritual, and then we, we go past the spiritual world into world Kabbalistically, which is called primordial man, which is Oilam Habo. And Oilam Habo is not what you think. It's not, it's not something which is called spiritual. Oilam Habo is a world which is greater than spirituality. I mean, it shares the common name of Ruchman, spirituality. But Oilam Habo, the future world, is a world where the Neshama and the Rabbanisham are together. And it's far beyond spirituality. But in any case, now, here comes the problem. The problem, it's great. This is what Adam was supposed to do, is just take the physical and transform it back into the, into the spiritual as a beginning of the journey to Ilum Hapo. But he didn't do that. Instead, he created, a, he, what he did is he, he actualized a new reality which was there in potential. And that is the world of the Satan. Evil. Tumor. Kripa, these are the worlds that are anti-God. That's really what they are. They, they are anti-God in the sense that they get you to think that you are somebody, that you exist independently. And that is the essential conflict of the whole Satan. To get you to think that you exist independently of God, and therefore you could do whatever you want, which of course is the sin. That's what he wants. So we're looking at a new kind of reality, an anti-God reality that wants to convince man, which is the world of physical, that he exists independent of God, okay, and therefore you could do whatever you want, and so on. And we, of course, now, so in the beginning, we were created as a physical being to also realize that even though we're physical, we are really part of the Rabbanu Shalom. You see, to see the reality of God. That was the original task. Now, the Satan, however, is an active force. So, originally, the problem was that we were physical. So, we have to see beyond that obstacle. But what Adam did by sinning is he introduced a new force. It's a new force or a new obstacle that prevents us from seeing the physical world. Excuse me, the spiritual world. You see? Uh, so Adam, as I had mentioned many times, made it much worse. He created the world of the Zoyama. Zoyama is the control that the Satan has over the physical universe. So now not only do we have to contend by the fact that we are physical, and therefore it's not obvious to us that there's a spiritual dimension and God, we now have to contend with a world which is an anti, which is a force that gets us to believe against the Rabbanu Shalom, against God. And this is the problem. <clears throat> therefore, what that meant, therefore, is that the major concern of this world is to get rid of the Satan. 98% of the job of a metakain, somebody who can remove that, somebody who can, uh, you know, at not atone, but somebody who can perfect the world, restore the world to a state, is getting rid of the Zoyamo. This is the problem. And the one who ultimately does that is the Mashiach Ben Yosef. You see. And then it returns to the world of Geshem without the Zoyama. And that, of course, is the world of Mashiach Ben David. And then in the year 2240, which is, of course, the year 6000, even Geshem is removed 
and the whole thing begins to transform or retransform into the world of Ruchmi. So that's a very important idea that our task is called work of Zoyamo. We are involved in cleaning up the filth or the world where there's anti-God. That's what we are involved in. Now, if we want to understand the stages of that, we can take a look at Mitzrayim, which is a revelation of the entire Tikkun program and its ultimate redemption, you see. And this, therefore, is what we are doing. So I'm going to list the seven stages of Egypt. And this is really a prototype, a model, of the whole program of Tikkun and the redemption itself. But then I want to talk about where we are in this program and what will happen. Okay? So the first thing, of course, is to create a Jewish people to do the Tikkun. And that, of course, is Avromo Vino. He is the being, right? He is the individual that is the Masake that will do the Tikkun. He is that person. So that's the first thing. And not only that, but to create that individual, right? And also to allow that individual to have a, a tribe, a peoples, a nation. And they will therefore try to take on the whole job of Tikkun, which is a very important concept, you see. Now, Egypt therefore will reflect, or actually the stages of history of the Jewish people. And Egypt, as the first attempt to remove the Zoyamor, that's what happens. So, the first thing you have is Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. You have what's called the uh, 12 tribes. And they live by themselves. They're not in the Klippa. I mean, they're, they're in Eritrea, surrounded by the Canaanim, the Canaanites. It's true. But basically, they live by themselves. You know, they're not really in the environment. They're not mixed in the environment of uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, the Goyim and so on the non-Jews. And what they are trying to do is develop themselves, is to strengthen their ability to believe in God, to trust Him, and to do whatever commandments is supposed to be done at that level of Tikkun, you see? And of course to learn about who God is, Nashkafa, Kabbalah, whatever. So that's the first stage, is when the Jews are alone, and they have to machazek themselves, they have to strengthen themselves, you see. Okay? So that's stage number one. Stage number two is they now have to remember what the, the major work is, is you have to remove the klipa, the tumor. You have to remove the satan. How? Because you have to take away his energies. And the energies of the satan at that time in the beginning of the history of the Jews, was that the Jews were commanded to do the Tikkun, which means that they have to take out all the Nitzitzit Kedusha, all the sparks of holiness, that the original 2,000 years of mankind, from Adam to Abraham, that they gave to the Satan, which I had mentioned, and so on. And we, they, uh, you know, the Jews and so on, Ab, the Avram and his descendants, they have to take it back. And then they could bring down the Kiddusha. So therefore, the first stage, of course, is the creation of a people. And that are the Jewish people. And they are alone, basically, in order to strengthen themselves and shape themselves into the vehicle, the tool that can take out the Kiddusha from the nation of the world, nations of the world. Ah, stage number two. Okay. And this is what the Ramonsham told Avraham Avinu. You have to go into a nation that will be the major nation of evil that represents, the, that's the firstborn of the Satan. These guys are his major agents, right? His major army. You have to go into that nation, you see. Not, no longer do you live alone, but you have to now go into a nation, you see. So that's stage number two, where they're now lo no longer by themselves. They are now surrounded and in the environment of a completely different nation. But that nation is not just a regular nation. That nation is terribly evil, tremendously uh, materialistic, and so on. They believe in gods, and so on. 
and the tremendously steeped in immorality. So they have to go into the nation. Is that so? That's number two. Number three is you have to live in that nation and resist the temptations of their culture, which is tremendously sinful. This is the third stage, the stage where you are in them and you have to resist their culture, the temptations to act like them, their values, what they hold to be important, their sins, their immorality, their cruelty, etc., etc. So that's the third. That's the third stage. You see. Then you have the fourth stage. Well, what happens if you cannot resist their temptations? What happens if you can't resist, right, the immorality of these people and all their culture and values and so on? Then what happens then is that you will be subject to their dominion, which means you will suffer. And the more you assimilate, assimilate the greater will be your suffering. And it is the suffering that will remove the holiness from these nations, away from the Satan. It will take it away from the grasp, the reservoir, the storage bins of the Satan, and bring it back to the side of the Svirot, the Kiddusha. So that is stage number four, which is very interesting. See, and that is how we understand Egypt. In the beginning, when you had the Shvatim still alive, right, the people did not really assimilate because they had the Shvatim. They could look at them as models. But after Yosef died, and all of them died and so on, they began to assimilate. This is the problem. So therefore, they had to go into what's called the, that stage that I mentioned. Because remember, the job of the Jews in Egypt is to take out the sparks of holiness. So either they take it out by remaining righteous, and that's how they empty the Satan, right? Or they take it out by... When they, if they assimilate, then they take it out by their suffering. And therefore, this is the essence of Galut, uh, not Gal, uh, of Golos. Yes, Galut. This is really what it's about. That we have to empty the Satan of all the Kiddusha that he has taken because of the sins of whoever was able to be metakein the creation. Initially, it was the 2,000 years of mankind, right? And then it's now the, the Jewish people. So, Galut means those two things are constantly interacting back and forth, you see. One time it's doing mitzvot, and that takes away tum'ah, that way takes away the energy of the satan, right, and restores it to kidusha, the svidot. That's one way. And if you find yourself assimilating and doing sins, in other words, in terms of the culture of the nation you're in, then all of a sudden things turn bad. You see? So that really, when you think about it, these are the two stages of Golos. So the idea is that Golos essentially, right, is to take back the Kedusha. And that's why we're spread all around the world, to take it back, you see, which I had mentioned previously. But it's always vacillating back and forth. Either we are able to do the mitzvot, or there's a segment of the Jews that do the mitzvot, so they are taking out the, the, uh, the Kedusha from the Kripa, the holiness from the, uh, the sparks of holiness from the uh, nation, which is, of course, the, is one of the agents of the Satan, in this case, the Bechor, right, by Egypt. Or they suffer. And in that way, they take out the Kedusha. You see, that is the essence of Golos. You now understand three points. One, the essence is to bankrupt the Satan from the Kedusha that he has, and it's done in one of two ways. The second point, it's done by remaining righteous. Third point, it is done by suffering at the hands of that agent, and that also removes the Tumah. There's a very important, beautiful understanding of what Golis really is. Those three points. Okay. Now, after that, something obviously has to happen. It has to come to an end because the Jews will have removed all the Nitzitzi Kedusha. You see, and as a result of that, they can now be redeemed. They can now go away and again begin to enjoy the fruits of redemption. In fact, that's what the Rav said. I think I mentioned this 
the Pesach Shir, that when the Bosh was said to Avram Avinu that your children were strangers in the land that they don't know, well, that was the first purpose. They have to remain strangers. Don't assimilate. But if they don't, then they will be enslaved. That's the suffering. You see? So the Bosh actually told that to Avram Avinu. And then it says, and afterwards, they will go out with great possessions, right? And the gematria of Yetzu B'chush Godel is gematria, numerical value, the Tzitzay Kedusha sparks holiness. You see, that gematria is an incredible gematria because it reveals what the real accomplishment in Egypt was. But then, at, afterwards, when it says they left, it says, V'yotzu Kol Tzivus Hashem, and all the hosts of God, right, left Egypt. So we know what they left with. The essential concept of leaving Egypt is with the what? The sparks of holiness, right? Because that's the divine plan. So the gematria, right, of Yotsu, called Tzivus Hashem, is also gematria, the Tzitzit Kedusha, the sparks of holiness, you see. Because that's really the whole purpose of Egypt, is listening to the word of God and not being influenced by the Goyim or those people that are underneath the charge of the Satan. Uh, now, we now understand what happened and what the whole essence of Galut is, you see? Now, the Jews are now ready to do what? To be redeemed because they did their job. So now we begin to encounter the other stages. So, so far I've told you four stages. Solo, where they're alone to build up, entering another country, not assimilating, being righteous, and then assimilating and then uh, doing the job. Now, stage number five is the beginning of redemption. And that's what we begin to see in the Tzavim, you see, where it says, even if you're outcasts, and they are outcasts in Egypt, or what? They are subject to Egypt, right? From there, I will take you, I will gather you. So what that means is that the Rosham has to do what? He has to gather them, right? What does kibbutz mean? I told you it means two things. It means he has to separate them, number one. And he has to begin, begin the Kedusha state, you see. So this is number five. What was the gathering and the separation in Egypt? What was the kibbutz? Now, it is important to understand that the kibbutz, in order for the Bansham to do that, the instrument that he will use is the Torah. The Torah is the only instrument that can be used to understand who is God, what is the purpose of creation, the concept of mitzvot, the concept of a spiritual universe. Uh, therefore, the Bansham has to give the Torah but wait a minute, they're in Egypt. So what Torah do they have in Egypt, in that sense? And the answer is, Torah is what? Torah is really the hasagot, the hasogas, the insight into God. Who is God and how he rules the world? So therefore, the equivalency of Torah as the fifth stage which is what will gather the Jews in Egypt, right, is the Ten Makas. Because it's important to understand, it's not a matter of just physical blows to Egypt. Each Mako was not only a blow to Egypt, simultaneously, it was a Hasaga. It was a tremendous divine insight, divine revelation of something about God, you see. We, we see that because in the mark of Chushech, darkness, it says, Ulechol Bnei Yisrael, and to all the children of Israel, Hoyor B'Moshoi Sam, there was light in their dwelling. That, that doesn't mean it was light in the sense that it wasn't dark. No. There was insight. They, in, we don't know what they saw, but everyone, each time there was a Maka, they understood some aspect of God, which really means that it was an understanding of some aspect of the sphera, of the Kabbalistic sphera. That is the Torah that God used 
to wake them up. That's what he used to separate them, you see, from the goyim, right? And to begin to, uh, to, to arrange them, to gather them. And that's what happened. He separated the Jews from the goyim, from the Mitzrayim. He was mantle, as it says, a nation within a nation, right? How? Because he showed them who he really is. So on one side, he punished the Egyptians, obviously he destroyed them. And on the other side, he separated them with the Torah. But the, the form of the Torah was the Makas itself, which is one of the greatest forms, because that's when you really see unbelievable revelation of the Divine Presence, which will only be strengthened by Kriya Samsov. But it says there that a handmaiden saw more Kabbalistically then Yecheskel Hanavi, and he was the he wrote the foundational book, the Meisim Merkava, the Divine Chariot. What was that? That insight is the Torah. That's it's not in general some some type of vision. That vision is part of the insights of the Torah itself. You see, so that's what he did. So that's the beginning of the kibbutz. You see, that is the kibbutz. He was able to separate the Jews from within the Klippa, right? From within Egypt. He didn't take them out of Egypt and then reveal to them. That's a different revelation, which we'll get into. But the revelation in Egypt itself was incredible. That was the equivalent of Torah, and that was the kibbutz. That is how he was able to separate the Jews, right? And, of course, gather them together, which, of course, is ultimately what they did. But then the second thing was the Kicho. This is all part of stage number five. The Kibbutz and the Kicho, you see. The Kicho is an infusion of an incredible amount of Kedusha beyond what we can imagine. And what was that represented in? Well, that was represented by the counting of the Oymah. That's the 49 days, you see. Those 49 days is the Kicho. That's what it is. So the kibbutz is what is Egypt with the Marcus, right? And the kicho is the beginning of the Jews coming back to God in the desert for 49 days, right? And they experience an unbelievable amount of kedusha, like I said, to the extent where a, uh, a maid servant, a handmaid, saw more of God's presence than even Yecheskel HaNovi. Now, we don't even know what that means. We have no concept of what Kriya Samsev. It was probably one of the greatest miracles or deviations from Teva, nature, that the world has ever known. That's how different it was. And the Medrash talks about it, that the whole sea split 12 ways and, and fruit was growing from the waters. We cannot even imagine. But the real thing was the unbelievable revelation that everybody had at Kriya Shamsuf, you see? And the Shira, of course, at the end of Kriya Shamsuf, reflects the revelation of what they had. It was so great that all Jews became Navim because everybody repeated the Oz Yoshia word for word, identical. Could you imagine a million people, millions of people saying the exact same thing, not knowing what the other guy is going to say? So that is the Kicho, you see? And the kibbutz and the kicha is stage number five. That, so it started from within the klipo to separate and to gather and then to leave and begin to experience tremendous kiddusha. Even though you're not by Martin Torah yet, but you are experiencing unbelievable kiddusha. And the zoyama is completely disappearing. In any case, so that is stage number five. And then stage number six is Matan Torah. You see, that is the giving of the Torah itself. That is where the Rebbein Shem appears in his full glory. And Matan Torah is something we cannot even begin to understand what type of a revelation, you know, and you just look at the psukim of Matan Torah and a chill has to run down your spine. If you really think about that they were experiencing something no man has ever experienced, perhaps, other than Moshe Abeno, of course, was part of them, and other Mauritian. 
But which man has ever experienced Matantura, the Giloi, the revelations of Sinai, is beyond comprehension. And that is stage number what? Stage number six. You see? And that is the equivalent, which I will mention, of God bringing everybody to Eretz Israel. That is the beginning of Mashiach ben Yosef, and so on. You see? And then, of course, you have stage number seven, which is the last stage, and that, of course, is the Messianic era. Because Matan Torah was really the introduction to that era. It's everything that had to take place. Moshe Rabbeinu was the, was the Mashiach ben Yosef. He should have been anyway. And then everybody died, which is basically they got up, which is Tres Amesim. And that should have continued to be the Messianic era. You see? With Mashiach ben Dovet, whoever that would be. And then they would go into Eretz Yisrael in that state. So there you are. Seven stages of redemption of Egypt. And all of this will be repeated, you see, when, now. And that's why what I want to examine is what stage that we are now. However, it will have to continue next week. Any questions? Yes, so where are we now? Okay, one second. Give me one second, please. They cannot be in the same room. Is anybody there? Yeah. 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 What happened? The rabbi left? I have no clue. He said, hold on. Who can't be under the same roof? We're recording. I can't talk now. It's being recorded. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, hello? Yeah. Is it still yeah. being recorded? Yes. Yeah. What? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so these seven stages is the stages of everything. From this, you can understand the entire what's called game plan of what it's all about. And I've taken that and shown you what they are, you see, and the concept that all of these were present in the Shriam. But this continues, you see, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, but the, I have to continue the Shia of how it continues, what it means about today, and what will happen in order to duplicate or replicate those stages. Because this actually tells us what will happen. You see, which is... Uh, so did we, of, we, did we do any of those stages already? Are any of the seven completed already from now? Yes, we have done stage one, which I'm going to go into next week. We have done stage one, okay. two, That's three... Fine. Okay, and four. That's it. We are headed. In, we are heading into stage five. Oh wow! And that's when, and that's the that's where the fun begins, if you want to use that word, you know. Okay. <clears throat> but it's worthwhile really understanding this, because I've laid out something which is really unusual, which is the entire game plan of creation. And why this is the game plan? Like I said, because of the sin of Adam, we changed the plan. And this requires, of course, all these stages. So we are now, just to preempt, we are now in stage, we are about to enter stage five, which really is the beginning of kibbutz. That's right. We are about to enter kibbutz, and that is the beginning of redemption. You see, this is, as far as I'm concerned, that's where we are holding, which is good news, because the difficult stages is stage one, two, three, and four. You see, it and is stage so five. 
What was that? So it's over. The worst is over. Yes. Basically, the worst is over because the darkness that we are experiencing is the end of the worst. And the kibbutz will reverse it. You see? So we are literally, you know, we're, the curve is, a, is literally almost bottoming out. And it's going to begin its upward curve. And that's the kibbutz. And once the kibbutz begins... So it's begins, like Makat Bech... What's that? Rabbi, it's like Makat Choshech, and then right after that we were redeemed. Yes. Yeah, we are the equivalent of, Mach, of, of uh, in a certain sense, uh, Machat Choshech, which in, in a certain sense is very interesting because it got dark in Egypt and it's dark by us. We're experiencing the same darkness, you see. And the kibbutz, what that will mean, the beginning of that is what the Bansham says, and I will bring all of the sufferings, all of the curses on the goyim, on those goyim that persecuted you, that destroyed you, all the anti-Semites. I mean, we cannot even begin. Look, when the Varsham says something, he is not playing around. He's going to destroy, and we will see it, the goyim, all those terrible anti-Semites that hate the Jews, everyone, and they all know who they are, they have no idea of what's going to happen to them. And they face the judgment. And that is, in many ways, the, that, that's the, the Makas Bechiris. In the end, the Varsham did something which is incredible. He killed every single Bechor, because the Bechor, the firstborn in Egypt, represents the spiritual uh, leader of the family. And he just killed them all. And he destroyed also the gods of Egypt. Just wiped it out. Wow. You see? Ah, so that is going to happen with the kibbutz. So we really, in a certain sense, are by Makas Choshech. Literally. Wow. We are in a terrible darkness. Right? Right? And, and it's, it's, just, it's just absolutely terrible. And the Egyptians still seek to, in Egypt anyway, they seek to dominate the Jews. But Makas Bechiris was the last straw. It destroyed them all. So they have no capacity even anymore to do anything. You know, they're so shocked. Like it says in the Torah, ain't bias, I ain't shum mace. There's no house that didn't have a dead person. You know, so you can imagine what Egypt experienced on that night. It was beyond belief. No nation has ever experienced that type of punishment where every house has a dead body. Mm-hmm. And that's basically where we're at. So... Marcus Bechiris is the end, and the kibbutz begins, you see? Actually, the kibbutz began, as I said before, because the Marcus themselves were the kibbutz, because they brought the Torah, the Hasaga, the incredible revelations of God, to the Jews while the things were going on. So kibbutz really is the Marcus, in that sense. So if you think about it, the end, the, uh, if you really want to think about it in that sense, because we have not reached the kibbutz. We're not so much in Choshech or the Makas. We are Moshe Rabbeinu at the Sneh. At By the Yeda bush? Elohim, and God knew. Yes, the burning bush. That is the turning point. The turning point, what begins the kibbutz, is the assignment to Moshe Rabbeinu by the Sneh to be the Mashiach. That's by Yeda Elohim, and that's the Pekidah. That finally the time has come where the Mashiach can know who he is and actually be assigned, designated by the Rabbanishim himself. Basically, that's where we're at. So you see? The kibbutz is the pikita. The what? The kibbutz. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the, pig, the pikita is the beginning of the kibbutz, yes. And like I say, the equivalent in, uh, in Mitzrayim is is Vayeda Lokim and God knew and Moshe Rabbeinu the Sne. Okay, Rabbi, That's, so I have a question. Yeah. So my question is when when Hashem uh, appeared to Moshe in the burning bush and then Moshe uh, then revealed uh, then came to the seventy elders and gave them the password, uh Pakodiv Kod, and then they knew that he was the one to redeem them, right? Yes. Yes. Did the seventy elders know 
at the time when Hashem was uh, meeting Moshe and the snare, did they know that that was happening? Because no. if they no. didn't know that the piggy dot happened, so who is it to say that we know if the piggy dot happened or not? It could have happened already. It's just that Moshe we like, won't. didn't go to the... We won't know. We will know only. We won't know. We will only know af- the aftermath of the Pekida. We don't know when it happens. Nobody knows. So the only one who knew was Moshe Rabbeinu. What? So it could have happened already. Hashem could have appeared to Moshe, Mashiach and Yosef, and it just in that holding pattern until he's ready to actually go. Yeah, it could. Yes, you're right. Theoretically, whoever the Mashiach and Yosef is could have been informed, and it, that's it. And for whatever reason, he is now, like Moshe Rabbeinu, even though he was informed and he knew, he still had to get to Egypt. He had to travel to Egypt, right? It took time. You know, travel in those days wasn't like it is today. So even after the Pekida, Moshe Rabbeinu and the Sne, you know, like I say, it took time to get to Egypt and try him. And the, the uh, initial attempt, of course, was, like I said, was to tell Pari the concept of the snakes. And that was the indication, the snake which I mentioned, that uh, the klipa has no more koyach. All the sparks of holiness have gone out of this of the uh, satan. And that's why Moshe Rabbeinu did his thing, which is the snake. And the Egyptians also produced snakes, which meant that there was still a little left. But Moshe Rabbeinu's snake devoured theirs. You see, which meant that nothing will remain of their snake. Of their, excuse me, of their nachosh, uh, their snake. You see, so it could have happened. Yes, we won't. We, we don't know except the one, the Mishnah ben Yosef. If it did happen to him, he knows. And we are now, you know, right before. You see, so therefore, uh, and remember, uh, it's, if the Mishnah is coming, which he is, because we are in the Mem Teshari Tuma, right? Then obviously you have to have all this. You have to satisfy judgment, uh, justice. And that is why it gets worse after Moshe Rabbeinu. Much worse. Uh, of course, Moshe Rabbeinu himself did not understand that. That's why he came he came running back to the Barsham. And he said, like, what happened? Uh, you know, unfortunately, he used the wrong expression. Lama Hari Oiso. Why have you done evil to these people? Which means he judged God to have done an evil. He should have just said, why have you done this? Like, what meaning does this have to my assignment? But he didn't say that. Well, for whatever, he was very upset, whatever Rashi said and so on. You see? Uh, so that is why. <clears throat> it's very possible that the Pekido already happened, right? And we are now in that darkness after the Pekido. You know? Yes. But this is the key concept. Yeah. So now in, in the Kibbutz part of it, when uh, yes. Makkah revealed another aspect of um, Hashem and another aspect of the Sefirot, um, how do we, like, are we going to tap into that as, as, it, as it goes through this process of the kibbutz for us? Yes. As it proceeds, it will become more and more obvious, right? Just like in Egypt. Finally, when the Gezerah of darkness ended, that's when the real thing began, the kibbutz. The insight, the Torah was given to the Jews in, to, in the form of giluyim, revelations, you see. And that's the beginning of, if you want to call it their education. And that is, began, is what separated the Jews from the Egyptians. You see, so something is going to happen, which I'm going to talk about next week, where we will in some way have incredible insights. Because the Barshma has to separate us from Western civilization. In some way, he has to bring us back, which I will talk about. First, he has to bring us back to the Torah or revelations of who he is. If not, then we'll never become separated. You see? So the revelations to separate us and then gather us and restore our identity as who we really are must come first. So by well, separating the Jews don't us, leave Egypt. They don't leave anywhere. What? By separating us, is that going to be... Um, I, I didn't understand. Say that again. Say that again. Okay. So when he separates us, are we going to be experiencing anti-Semitic 
uh, pushback? Well, that's the concept of the war of Goy and Magoy. You see, so there will be a pushback initially, yeah. And that's the war of Goy and Magoy. But the interesting thing about it is that that will be after Mashiach ben Yosef. Because in that war, it, it, theoretically, he's supposed to be killed. So what will happen is there will be a slight pushback, but much more when we head to Eretz Yisrael. You know, it's after the kibbutz and the beginning of the of the uh, of the uh, kicha. That's when Goy from the land of Mogoy realized that it's over, because the Jews are now separated. They have now gathered, and they are now back in Eretz Yisrael. And it's not only that, but there's also based on Mikdash. That's when the evil really goes crazy. Because the next thing is Mashiach ben David. So as long as there's Mashiach ben Yosef, the, the Goyim, or the, the, all the anti-Semites, whatever, you know, they can think that they can try to war with the Jews and so on. Because they don't want a real Messianic era. But once the Mashiach ben David comes, then he wipes them out. So there will be a pushback, yes. But it won't be initial. It'll be slow because devotion will stop them. Or else, obviously, because if they really do it, then the Kaiso won't even have a kibbutz. Uh, so in some way, he will restrain them, you see, in order for the Jews to experience all that, you see. And, and, and so on. And, and uh, that will happen, you see. Okay, so if I understand correctly... We're in America, let's say, and Hashem is going to start, God willing, to reveal himself through um, a revelation where it brings us closer to him and that we see um, his hand and we have uh, we glorify his name through seeing him and, and believing in him. And yes. then uh, as that happens, the revelations happen, um, Mashiach ben Yosef comes and he helps gather all the people four corners of the earth, and we go to Eretz Yisrael, where the Beit HaMikdash, God willing, will come down, and when we, by the time we're already in, uh, engulfed in the, this process of the Messianic era, that's when Gog Magog is going to try to get to us, but by then it's way too late, we're already like so entrenched in Hashem that it won't even affect us. Exactly. It'll just be a basic attempt to destroy the Jewish people, to stop the entry of a messianic era, which means the end of Tumor. This is the problem, that their way of life, to defy and to deny God, is over, and they realize that. Their power to rule is over, and that's why they try to destroy Mashiach ben Yosef. See? And the one who will destroy them is Mashiach ben David. That's uh, what's going to happen. So we could very soon be entering that period of holiness. Like, can some of us already be entered, like, uh, like starting before others? Is that possible? Well, I, what I think will happen is I think there will be what's called an awakening. Slow. There will be things that awaken the Jews to begin to think that, well, maybe not everything is what I thought it was. You see? So that is the beginning of a process of what's called a transformation. So I do believe that there will be events that even if they're not outright revelations, there is the beginning, it's called a stirring. It's a hisoirus. There is some type of awakening, a stirring of consciousness that there's something happening you know, I, even now, if you think about it, you know, if you think about what's happening today, you know, with America and, and all this kind of nonsense and craziness going on, people are astounded. They've never seen this before. America has never done this kind of thing. Well, well, I mean, America is now acting, as, uh, 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 it's like a, an uncivilized society, you know, and America is acting in a way which is uncivilized. Nobody has ever seen this power grab, this absolute nonsense in terms of who the president is or the liberals or the progressives and the Democratic Party and all that. They've never seen this kind of takeover 
and go downhill and become, it, it's like an insane asylum, you know? So that automatically produces an awakening, that there's something happen, that, happening that's historical. So if you want, you could look at the darkness itself as the beginning of a his or as you would say, hit orerut, an awakening of consciousness, that things happening now are so beyond what people expected that people have to begin thinking that maybe we are close to the Mashiach. So you could actually interpret the darkness, that this darkness itself is an awakening because it is so bizarre and so historical, never happened before, that people are already saying to themselves, hmm, we seem to be in the beginning of a messianic era. Then it will get stronger and stronger. So what I'm saying is that the darkness itself is a first stage of awakening. You see? Okay. Sounds like everybody is satisfied. So wait, my question is that... Yeah, only that one thing goes- confused me too. Yes. Yeah, what are you saying? Amy, talk. Okay, I'll talk. Um, I was saying that you said Hashem himself will come into the klipa, into the pit, and gather us, right? Yes, yes. So, if, if Hashem is not, is it going to be, like, totally um, known that it's Hashem doing it? Is everyone going to know? Is there still going to be a conspiracy? We're still going well, to... Well, yeah, the, the belief that this has to be orchestrated by the Rabbanu Shalom, will get stronger and stronger, yes. Like so, COVID, yes, I, I, I believe, COVID, I believe, obviously, it was from Hashem. Everything from A to Z was, like, orchestrated in His divine plan, divine way. But a lot yes. of people still, they, they think that that belief is a conspiracy, and they still believe that it's science and it's China and whatever, whoever it is. Well, so that's how, why it requires a greater awakening. That's why after a while, things will become so blatant to everybody, you know, that there's something going on that doesn't make any sense. America has never become so bizarre, and therefore people will say, this cannot be normal. This has to be a change in civilization of some sort. It'll grow, you see. Look, you have to remember one thing. God does not shock the world unnecessarily. He's not going to do that, you see. Even by Paroi, you see, the first thing he brought was snakes against him. You know, and then Paroi thought, okay, he's going to have the zero, have to have the straw. But, you know, the Bansham wants to slowly allow people to uh, become aware. So there will be a growth in awareness, and it becomes more and more obvious that the Bansham is in charge, and it's all happening. Because of him, yes. It's a process. So if he's going to go in the pit and take us out, isn't that the Pasuk Me'ashba Yarim Evyon? Correct. But those two Pasukim, by the way, Me'ashba is Yarim Evyon, right? Uh, and um, the other Pasuk is, uh, uh, oh, what's the Pasuk again? Uh, the first part of the Pasuk, what's that again? How well? Or mikimi me offer dough. That's it. Mikimi me offer dough, right? Ume ashpa is yom evyoin. Really refers to Klai Israel, but it really refers to the Mashiach. That the Mashiach is the dough, and he's in the dirt. It refers to both the Jewish people and the Mashiach. Ume ashpa is yom evyoin. That's what it means, which is a very, which is a very good point that you bring out. Uh, that right now, Christ's will is in the dirt, is in the dust, is in the garbage. You see? So the Varsham has to go into the garbage, I hate to use that term, but he has to go into the garbage to take the Jews out. You see? They're all buried in the mud. That's how low the Jews have sunk. That tells you the state of Jews. And it doesn't mean, uh, you know, uh, physical. It means spiritual. The Jews are in a terrible stage spiritually. 
they are considered as if they're in the mud or in the garbage. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you think about it, what's the gate next to the Kaisal called? Sharashpo. Right? It's the gate of what? Garbage. Isn't that a funny name to have a gate that is next to the holiest site in Judaism? And that's the answer. Because really, the stage that the Jews are in is Ashpo. The Kaisal is in the Ashpo. That's where the Jews are. They are so low in Ruchnias that it is called either Ofer, dirt, mud, or Ashpo, garbage. You see? That's where the Jews are. So the Bershom has to go into that and rescue and save the Jews. That's what he has to do. And it will begin by the kibbutz. So and that's what begins the process. When they say Ashpot, they say it's Tashin Pei Aleph. So we really only have a couple of more months to be, like, you know, prison from the garbage. Yes, perhaps. Yes. It could be. in a, it, it, Look, it's very possible that the kibbutz will begin, hopefully, before Shavuot. I mean, I don't want to raise your hopes, but, you know, uh, it's very possible that Tavshin Pei Aleph, which is the same letters as Ashpo, will begin now, in the, the days of the Svira. You know? Yeah, that's right. Listen. Just a little more darkness, and we'll all be out of here. Okay. I will continue this year next week, especially to show, you know, what the kibbutz and the uh, picha is, and how it proceeds in terms of today's time. You see? But now you, I think you have a much better understanding of what's called the game plan of God. What the whole thing is really all about. The different stages that the Jews go through in order to do their task. You see? Why we have this task of Zoyamo. What the Jews do. And what are the stages, right, of rescue, of redemption? You see? I think you you have a much better feeling and understanding uh, of what all this means. So next week I will continue uh, about this whole, the concept, uh, you know, in terms of the kibbutz and so on.